Hey, welcome to the Vive Church podcast. You have found us at the beginning of a brand new series called It's All on the Table. This is going to be a great series. And today we have one of our campus pastors from Palo Alto, Pastor Michelle, bringing the word. Enjoy. Today we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 7, verse 24. And I have the privilege, honor, pressure to launch us into this new series today. So um, we're going to do like a Bible. Who likes Bible studies? I know actually a lot of you like Bible studies. Um, So we're going to go through the text. And I am praying that as we go through this text, that you find yourself in it, that you place yourself in this text. And the text that we're going to look at is pretty meaty. It's a lot going on in there. But Pastor Kira says this so brilliantly. She says, sometimes when I read the scriptures, I find that the scriptures read me. And that's what happened to me when I read the scriptures. So come with me. Mark chapter 7, verse 24. It says, Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it, yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as she heard about him, as soon as she heard about him, a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. The title of my sermon today is, there's always a seat at the table. There's always a seat at the table. Let me pray. Father, Lord, I just thank you so much that you are here. You've been here since the beginning of time, God, that you saw this moment when you created the universe. You saw every single life, that every person here represents not just themselves, but their family and the communities around them. And I pray, Father, that I become so less and you become so great, Father, that your words come and pierce the heart in the way only you can, God, that you speak so powerfully, you move so intimately, Father, Father, and you dissect for us, Father, and shift us to a place where we are closer to you. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and high-five your neighbors. Say, how you doing? Well, today is a very special day. Um, Not only is it Super Bowl Sunday... So I will be preaching for the next three hours, and then we'll just flip the screen and we'll all watch the, welcome to my Super Bowl party. Um, But we're going to get you out of here because I know you've got amazing plans. Um, Who's Raider Nation? Who are my Raider Nations in here? Oh, 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 there you are. All right, Raider Nation, don't sip on that hateration. Let's all be one and united in God and in Christ and support the 49ers to victory. Today is always, <laughs> and I'm done. No, today is also um, 0202 2020. Um, so I just, uh, nerdy sense of me loves that because it's a palindrome. It's the same forwards and backwards. And I just sense God has something in our midst today that he wants to do from the front to the back. So it's going to be an incredible time. But how many people here grew up around the dinner table? Like you came from pretty formal un- bringing all your meals were at the table, you ate together as a family, you discussed the day's events, etc., etc. How many people did not? You ate at the kitchen table, you ate on the floor, you ate whatever you could because you just had to come in and, yep, I, I'm with you. You had sports after school, so you just grabbed it and ran. And how many people were a combination of both? Like Monday through Friday, you were pretty much grab and go, but when it came down to it, weekends, and you had people over, you found the dinner table and you brushed it off and you guys sat around. That's where, that's where I am. That's where I, how I grew up for the most part. Um, We would have, I I grew up in church. I've been in church since I was born, literally. Um, And I remember after church on Sundays, we would um, have people over. And I used to love this because even whether I had friends or not, I knew the food would be good. Like we went all out when we had guests over. Um, And our food was usually good. It was really delicious. But on Sundays, especially after church, it was great. My role um, at this time was to set the dinner table or the lunch table really at that time. And we'll have like cloth tablecloths and we would have 
cloth napkins and fine cutlery um, and f silverware and plates and cups. Um, and I, I love the hope and I love the formality of the table and everything like that. But um, this particular day, young Michelle um, realized that you can have tension at the dinner table. Who knows about tension at the dinner table? Um, this actually comes up a lot in, like around Thanksgiving when you have those relatives coming from out of town that you don't see very often. And you have Uncle Bob who always finds that's the perfect time to bring up, what do you guys think about Trump? And like half your family's from California and half your family's from Tennessee. And you're like, oh gosh, like here we go. Um, tension can be found around the dinner table. And young Michelle found out about tension Attention. Um, my mother is beautiful and gorgeous and everything great. She also had this amazing ability to control us with her eyes. She could look at us from across the room. And it's almost like the worst. I, almost, I just feel like, oh, come on, just give me the spanking now. Because it's just that fear of knowing that what's to come and you just can't relax anymore. You're, your friend's home and she's looked at you like, oh, I know what's going to happen. I'm going home. So she would do that. Um, and we were sitting around the dinner table. We were having lunch. We had, we had friends over. And I thought it was a great time to start, you know, kicking my sister and playing games under the table. And so I'd kick her and she, you know, my little sister would make a sound. And so my mom looked and she gave me one of those looks. And I decided in that moment that I'm going to stand up for children everywhere. And the look is enough is enough with that look, okay? Just do what you need to do. And so, oh yeah, no, I did. I, I was like, oh, this is a smart plan. So I said, so she looked at me, I kick her, she looks at me, and everyone's talking, having a good conversation. And from across the table, I say to my mother, why are you looking at me like that? I don't remember the rest of the day or what happened. Uh, it goes hazy at that point. I just know in my heart that I never did that again. Because let me, I mean, I mean that moment, as soon as I said it, the tension could be felt. And that's what we have in this passage here. We have tension upon tension upon tension. And it actually begins in the very first verse when the writer Mark tells us that Jesus left the place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. And by telling us that, he lets us know that Jesus is in the place fraught with tension. You see, Tyre was um, a, a, a region of, that, of the world. It's actually where Lebanon is today. I love reading the Bible and like actually seeing where it is in real time because those words mean nothing to me. It's like Philistine, like where were they? But like, so Tyre was like where modern day Lebanon is today. And it's about Northwest from Galilee because you guys all know where Galilee is. Um, and so what you find is Jesus is in this place and this place was not only, you know, literally removed from where he was familiar from, but the people of that place were pagan. They followed their own ways. In fact, it is believed that Jezebel, this was her home region. And if you guys don't know anything about Jezebel, she was a really, really, really bad person in the Bible. She was Queen Jezebel, and that's why there are not a lot of people named Jezebel today. Um, she did some really, really, really evil things. And so it's in this region that you find the scene take place, and then you find this uncomfortable discussion take place. And I just want to put us in a position because sometimes God needs to take out of, out of what seems comfortable and what seems familiar and what seems like in our comfort place to reveal some truth to us and reveal and show us what's really in our hearts. And that's what we find Jesus to today in this scripture. In fact, in through this scripture, we actually see three different types of people. And I want us to go through and look with this. It's going to be uncomfortable a little bit. And the scriptures might read you a little bit, but try and put yourselves in the different people we see. The first character, and I'm just going to start off right off the bat and address the elephant in the room, is Jesus. Jesus. And the part of it is in this scripture, we actually find Jesus say, if not the most offensive, one of the most offensive things we've ever heard Jesus say. You can see, he says this woman comes to him, it says in the scripture, she fell at his feet, a position of complete humility, and says, Lord, help my daughter. And Jesus says to her, first let the children eat their bread, for it is not right to toss the bread and give it to the dogs. By doing that, Jesus compares this woman to a dog. And I've, I was reading through different commentaries and some people were saying like, oh, well, it's not like a street dog. It's like, you know, more of a house dog. It's like, a listen, if someone tells me um, and calls me a dog, I'm not going to sit there and ask, what kind, what kind of dog are you talking about? That being said, I have seen some dogs, especially at Stanford Mall, that look like they have a good life. Those dogs, you've seen that they have like shoes on their feet and they have Louis Vuitton jet. I'm like, you probably eat better than me. My dog, especially, he's got a, he has a very sensitive stomach. And so we have like a 
like a very regimented diet for him. He's raw, organic, and he eats. So I do get some of you out there that might be dog. I am a dog person. Might be like, oh, that's not too bad. I'm telling you right now that this was as offensive as it sounds to her. And so I had to question. I was like, Jesus, why would you say that? Why would the God that we know is loving and gracious and, and wants us the best for us, why would you compare this woman to a dog? Well, there are, there are reasons that I started to unpack as I went through the scripture. The first one is I believe Jesus was giving voice to what was already in the hearts of man. You see, Mark doesn't mention it, but we're going to look at this version of the story in Matthew. And we find that in this home was not just Jesus and the woman, but there were also at least the disciples there, if not other people. And around that time, there was a very commonly held belief and a very um, common term that was used among the rabbis to describe people who were Gentile, which this woman was. And they would refer to them as dogs. The children of Israel were children and they were dogs. And so Jesus took on that role. We sometimes have that friend, you know, that says what everyone is thinking in the room, but no one actually says out loud. But you're a little bit grateful for them because you're like, oh, someone said it. And so he says it to get their attention. Because they would have recognized, like, oh, finally, he's with us. Because everything Jesus says up to this point, they're probably like, oh, gosh, you're just so, you're against our cultures. You're coming to change it. But in that moment, they would have felt like, okay, he's finally getting it. But then he does that. He creates that not to be harmful and not to be hurtful, but to illustrate a truth of the kingdom in this moment. The second thing I think Jesus does this is he um, wants to just emphasize the significance of the miracle that's to take place by just showing how undeserving this woman is. Because what he was saying was not necessarily entirely wrong. He was sent first to the children of Israel. When you read it through like the old prophecies and everything about the Bible, that was where it was, that's where his mission was. His first priority was to the children. He doesn't say, no, you can't have anything. He said, first, let the children eat their bread. And so I think when I read that, I was like, oh, God, what you're illuminating for us is that it's okay to have your friend group and your family group and those you love have priority in those God is putting in your world to reach out to. But by the end of the chapter, by the end of this scripture, we see that God does perform the miracles, which shows that we do not have any right to exclude anyone. Like you may have priority in relationships, but that does not mean to the exclusion of people. I think he also, by doing this, he realizes to us that there is going to be such a significance in understanding who we are and whose we are. So that's the first character, Jesus. The next character we see in the Bible is the disciples. Now, Mark doesn't make note of the disciples in his version of the accounts, but I believe God was like, the Holy Spirit inspired the scripture and said, uh-uh, in your version, Matthew, I want you to tell you what the, what the disciples were thinking. So in Matthew 15, 22 to 23, we see um, the verse begins, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Verse 23. Jesus did not answer a word. So the disciples came to him and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. You see, the disciples had, in this moment, were realizing that there's this woman that keeps nagging. She just keeps asking for you. Can we just get rid of her? Because you're not even answering her right now. And I don't know about you if you've ever been in a position where you know people were intentionally trying to exclude you from something and how hurtful that can feel, and how isolating that can feel. Um, the disciples actually remind me of a very good movie, very educational movie, called Mean Girls. Um, I don't know if this girl, this, whole, this, whole, this is where our youth sit, they all look at me like, oh yeah. And there's this scene in Mean Girls where one of the girls is starting to gain weight, and so she comes to the, to the table, and one of her friends from previous things tells her, you can't sit with us, you can't sit with us. And I feel like the disciples channeled their inner mean girl performance. And basically by doing what they were saying was, you can't partake in us. You can't partake in us. We're hashtag team, no new friends. The third group of, the third character we see in this story is the woman. Now I love this woman. She actually, if I could meet all the people I'm going to meet on the other side of glory and eternity, I want to meet this woman because the amount of guts it takes to do what she did is incredible. You see, for some of you may know, because um, it's pretty obvious, I grew up in China. Um, when I was, 
Why are you laughing? When I was 13, um, I, we, moved, we were in Australia, and we moved from Melbourne to Beijing, China. And when I first got there, I have never felt so other than in that moment. Um, I didn't speak the language. I didn't even know how to use chopsticks. I vividly remember our first meal. Went to a restaurant, and we sat down. It was like a lazy Susan, because they have, you know, and you're eating your meal. And um, I got the sticks and using both my hands, and my mom there trying to teach us how to use, and I'm really, I can't even eat in this country. Um, but my family stayed there for nearly 10 years altogether. I was there for six before I came to America for college. And I was actually only supposed to stay here for four years, but then I met Luke, and here we go. Um, but, but I came to America, and after 10 years or six years of living in China, I that was home to me. So when I came to the US, um, I remember the first week of orientation, we had um, all the student groups like love to like woo the freshmen. So the Asian Student Association had like a freshman night and then the Hispanic Student Association, blah, blah, blah. And so we get down the African American Student Association. So I got invited to go to them. And I remember walking into the hall and looking out about 200 African American students and I'd never felt so other in my life. And I remember thinking like, yo, Asian Student Association, where are you at? Like, ni menshi wa da Like, I, but it wasn't quite clear that those would be my people. Like, that was my, now more comfortable for me. And I feel like this woman was very, feel, very, felt very other. You see, first of all, she was a she. She was a woman. And she was also um, a Greek Gentile. So not only was she a different gender, she was of a different religion. And then finally, she was from that pagan region we mentioned before that made her like a dog. And this woman did not use all those, those things that the world would have listed to make her feel um, less than, but instead she took, found courage and began to dialogue with the savior. So you have these three groups of people, Jesus, the disciples, and the woman. At this time, can I have the table brought out, please? Um, we are going to s change scenes right now, and we're gonna set a table. Because the name of the series is It's All on the Table. And at the top right now, I just want to make it very clear that the table is the church. I don't know about you, but I, I worked as a lawyer for many years. And when you would hear, you know, there's a seat at the table for you, you would think of it in the, in the sense of climbing the corporate ladder and getting a seat or literally getting a board seat or whatever it might be. But here in this context, this table is the church. And in those characters, in those three different people that we just mentioned, may I submit that maybe at some point in your life you've been each one of them. You see, this, every time we see the table setting, especially when it comes to communion, we have this scene right here with Jesus at the head of the table. And in Middle Eastern and in, in especially Asian culture, actually, the head of the table is in the middle, not necessarily at the ends. And so you have Jesus here, and I'm always like, did no one sit on this side of your picture? You're like, oh, this but well, that's the side. But you have Jesus at the head of the table. And maybe you, rec you see yourself as Jesus. You see yourself as someone who has extended the invitation. You're always asking people to come in. May I just challenge you in this moment that Jesus does not just invite those that are familiar and comfortable, but he extends the invitation and extends the invitation and extends the invitation to everyone. No matter what they look like, no matter who they are, there's an, inv there's an invite that is extended all the time. Or perhaps you see yourself like the disciples. And that's where I sometimes see myself, actually, where I actually have a seat at the table. In fact, if you were in this house right now under the sound of my voice, or even if you're watching online, you've, you've found the church in some way, and you have a seat at the table, and it's a comfortable seat. And what can happen sometimes when you get into this place of comfortability and you're now at the table is you can start to subtly, very subtly start to put a filter on what you see. And you look out to your friends and family and you start to think to yourself, huh, I wonder if they're church people. Should I invite them? Nah, they probably won't come to church. And very, very subtly, you begin to discredit certain people from coming to the table because you're deciding whether or not to extend the invite. And what we do when we do that is we are just like the disciples and we're saying, send them away. And it's so hard to wrestle with that because you're like, I am, not, I am not prejudiced. I have nothing in my heart against people. But what about Uncle Bob who keeps bringing up Trump? What about that relative that can get under your skin? Or what about that person that keeps just, uh, you're like, uh, I don't think they need to be an invite. 
But I feel like God challenges us in those moments to make sure that we remove those filters and act like Jesus and extend the invitation to everyone, no matter where they are, no matter who we think, no matter what. Because I tell you, that woman is in your workplace, that woman is in the cafe, that woman is at the register, that woman who everyone will discredit and will put aside is in your world for a reason so that you can extend a table, invite to this table. Maybe, you're, maybe you see yourself as the woman and you're not even at the table. I hate being excluded from stuff. You know what I mean? Like when you know there's a party going on and everyone's posted about an Instagram and you're like, I didn't get an invite to that. I, didn't, I don't even want to go anyway, but I was busy. Or the worst is when you get an invite late and you knew the party was going on two weeks ago and they, they called you up the night before and was like, hey, we want you to come. And you're like, you're just using me to fill space. I don't feel worthy. I don't feel loved at all. You see, what I love about this woman is that even though she had every reason to feel excluded, every reason to feel little, she didn't use that position to be a victim. You see, she, she, she wrestled with Jesus. And what we see actually is, if you read the verses, a few um, verses up from where we started, you see Jesus previous to that was actually in dialogue with the Pharisees and he was working hard to just get basic biblical truths into them. And he's working them, he's like, oh my gosh, it's not what is on the outside that makes you defy, but what's on the inside of it. He's trying to just explain to them really co clear, concrete things. But this woman, when Jesus says to her, first let the children eat what they want, then for it is not right to talk to the dogs the children's bread she then replies and says yes Lord but even the dogs under the table will eat the crumbs she grasped in that moment that it's not about position but proximity that even if I if I can just get into the house of God if I can just be a doorstop in the house of God it is better than being anywhere else I would rather be at under the table I don't need to be at the head of the table I don't need a full-on seat but if you just give me under the table I will have what I need for proximity to Jesus is always better than position the other thing that I loved about this woman, I think she was maybe better than half our coders and engineers in the Silicon Valley today, because she understood reverse engineering. See, what she says to him is, yes, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs. Now, I love bread. Apparently, my doctor says I might have gluten sensitivities, but, um, <laughs> but I still love me bread. And the thing about bread is that if you take a crumb of bread and you take that crumb over to a scientist to tell, hey, I love this bread, can you give me the recipe? The, what you're doing is you understand that if there was milk in the bread, there's milk in the crumb. If there was eggs in the bread, there's eggs in the crumb. If there's flour in the bread, there's flour in the crumb. If there's yeast in the bread, there's yeast in the crumb. If there's miracles in the bread, there's miracles in the crumb. If there's deliverance in the bread, there's deliverance in the crumb. If there's freedom in the bread, there's freedom in the crumb. If there's acceptance in the bread, there's acceptance in the crumb. And you don't need to jar and fight for the whole bread once you get the revelation that just a crumb is enough for me. And you see, this woman also understood the importance of grace the importance of grace, grace that comes from humility. Because when, she, when Jesus says, Ugh, I, it's not right to give the children's bread and toss it to the dogs, she says, yes, I am a dog. And there's something that happens that can transpire the moment we come with humility. And humility is not just putting yourself low and being like, oh, no one loves me. Because if she was like that sense of humility, she would not have responded to Jesus. When he called her dog, she had that false sense of humility, like, I'm nothing. Then she would have just scurried away. But she grasped that concept of humility. And she said, I may be a dog, but even the dogs eat the crumbs. And I want us to get, because no matter which group of people, person you see yourself, whether you see yourself as the person extending the invite and you need to just be challenged about where you're extending it to, whether you see yourself like the disciples and you already have your seat at the table, but you're challenged right now, like when was the last time I actually invited someone to church? Not just told them I go to church, not just when they asked what are you doing this weekend, I said mm, nothing much. When was the last time I actually extended that invite? Or whether you see yourself as that woman, the one thing that is clear in all those groups in order for true freedom is to realize it's not about you. 
You see, that woman, she was not there for something inside of her body. She was not there for an ailment in her body. She was there on behalf of her daughter. So either the need of others should push us and propel us to get to the feet of Jesus, say, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. I am just so convicted more than ever that God is looking for a people that will get over themselves, that will put aside their own feelings of hurt. I don't know what kind of church you grew up in. I don't know whether the church has mistreated you, but this is not that church. You're not there anymore. And it's time to invite people into this space, into this realization, the freedom of Jesus. And I constantly get challenged because when she was there, you know, it says in Mark chapter 3 that crowds will gather from all over, including the region of Tyre where this woman is. So when she first heard about Jesus, it would have been hearsay. It would have been because someone else had experienced Jesus and told them about it. And I actually met someone who came to Vibe because they overheard a conversation of someone who goes to Vibe talking to their coworker about this church. And he was like, I've got to check it out because she seems lit. You've got to watch the conversations and how you speak about the church, about the house of God. There's not going to be everything you love, but you never know who's hearing. Because she overheard this conversation so much, so, so much did it impact her because she had watched her daughter year after year after year wrestle with this demon that it says in the word, as soon as she heard, she went to him and fell at his feet. And I want us to be a people where they, as soon as they hear about what God has done in our lives, as soon as they hear about how He's changed us, that they come to Him and fall at His feet. I think it's incredible the privilege that God gives each one of us to be His message of salvation to the world. Sometimes I think, Lord, this must not be your plan. Like, there must be other people. But I look around and it's like, nope, you're it. We are it. And so if there's an empty seat next to you right now, I want you to think about who could be sitting in that seat. Because this room by fact shows that there's always a seat at the table. There's always a seat at the table. Every single empty seat shows that there's always a seat at the table. And I don't know if you know about Vive Team, but we can find you a seat at the table. Because there's a revelation as a church that we have, is that these seats at this table, this table is the church, these seats, we didn't create them. It was the grace and the mercy of God. It was by His grace and God has made a way where there is no way. He decided, I'm going to fashion so many seats that you cannot run enough. And sometimes I think we operate so limited in our thinking that we don't realize that God has seats upon seats upon seat at His table that He wants us to fill. If you stand up for me right now, we're going to start closing this. But I just think it's so incredible that we have the privilege to be able to extend God's kingdom. You see, in the Matthew's account, I love this because when she comes and she answers him so wisely, he says to her in some version, it says, woman of great faith. He recognizes her faith in that moment. And it constantly reminds us that to get a seat at the table does not mean that you have to look for your positioning. It does not mean that you have to fight and jaw for it, but that there is a seat made by grace, but it needs your faith. It needs your faith in this moment. So with every eye closed, every head bowed, I want you just to take a moment to think right now. Do you see yourself like Jesus? Do you see yourself like the disciples where you know you've been a Christian for quite a while, but if you were honest, you couldn't remember the last time you invited someone to church. If you were honest in your heart, you can't remember quite the right last time you saw someone in your world come to church with you and experience that same grace for themselves. Or do you see yourself like the woman and you've been hurt and you've been excluded intentionally sometimes and you've thought to yourself, ah, that church thing's not for me. I'm just gonna stay on the outside because I don't belong. I just want you to just think through that right now. Because I feel without a shadow of doubt in my being that I'm on assignment today to break that over you and let you realize that you were so integral in this story that there is always a seat because even though everyone in this auditorium looks like they have it all together, we don't. 
Pastor Adam once said, you don't have to have it all together, but you can have it all together together.